The entrepreneurial spirit is resilient, and U.S. Bank is here to make sure that no matter what unknown pops up, business owners know that we have their back. Because problem solvers are the ones that keep us all moving forward by finding ways to close gaps, even when distances are being kept everywhere. So whatever you need to adapt and evolve your business, U.S. Bank is here to support you. U.S. Bank. We'll get there together. Equal housing lender member FDIC. COVID-19 vaccinations are available now at Meyer for those that are eligible. Text COVID to 75049 to register for your free vaccinations at Meyer and get updates to your phone. Please complete only one registration at one location. Additional entries will replace your previous registration and may increase your wait time. You can also talk to your Meyer pharmacist or visit clinic.meyer.com for more information. Remember, just text COVID to 75049 to get started. The following is a Hoop Bowl presentation. What is going on? It is the Hoop Ball Clippers podcast coming at you on a Saturday afternoon. Going to be joined by Justin Wilson of LA Clippers Film. Haven't had him on in a couple of weeks, so excited to break things down with him. We've chatted offline about a couple of topics, and it'll be fun to go more in depth here on the pod. So hope you're having a great weekend wherever you are. And for the Los Angeles Clippers, boy, 36-18, and 18, you'll gladly take that. Currently sitting a game and a half back of the Phoenix Suns, those same Phoenix Suns that the Clippers beat 113 to 103 on Thursday. When it came to this podcast on Monday, I said the Clippers had some pretty easy games coming up, but before they got to the Houston Detroit games, got to take care of business against Portland and against Phoenix. That's exactly what the Clippers did. Beat Portland by 17, a game in which Paul George had 36, and then went and beat Phoenix two days later by 10. PG had 33. He has been outstanding of late. And we had some concerns, obviously, about his foot with the bone edema. And all of a sudden, you look and the Clippers are getting production from PG. And they rested him in that game yesterday. And the Clippers used a monstrous second quarter knockoff Houston. And I thought that was going to be a really bad loss. Shades of the game against Orlando, one that maybe... A lot of games in a short amount of time. You have guys that are sitting because of rest. And I didn't want to see that excuse. And I'm really glad the Clippers came out and beat Houston. They've got one more against Detroit on Sunday that they need to take care of. And if they do, end up 7-2 and two on the homestand, which would be really impressive. And I said coming into this homestand, if you go 7-2, and two, you will gladly take that. I'm assuming the Clippers will be a favorite in that ball game. If you want to bet on them, I know where you can bet. How about mybookie.ag? Ever since I started this podcast, people are always asking me for betting tips. They're asking where I'm betting. They're asking me about money line versus spread. They're asking me about prop bets. And I say, you know what? I know what I'm doing, but I also know a couple other people that know what they're doing. And that is the guys over the hoop ball gaming division. They do a great job. And they also bet at my. Bookie. My bookie's rep is rock solid. They've got the best odds, contests, and promotions in the business. The only place I trust to handle my Premier League bets, my NBA bets, my college basketball bets, my NFL bets when it's during the season, MLB, whatever you want to bet on. The Masters, it's there at my bookie. I don't care about my stamp of approval easily. You got to be the best at what you do. And my bookie's the best sports book out there, period. It's simple. Sign up, enter the promo code HOOPBALL. It's easy. The promo code is HOOPBALL and get your deposit matched halfway up to a thousand bucks. Head over to my book if you want to add a little excitement to the sports you love and the games you bet. Bet with the best. Bet with my bookie. All right, let's go ahead. Let's bring him in. Let's chat a little Clippers basketball with my buddy, Justin Wilson. I said that Justin Wilson would be my co-host bi-weekly, but things have been crazy on both of our ends. But we finally figured out a date to get both of us on the Hoop Ball Clippers podcast. It is today on this Saturday afternoon. Justin, you and I have gone back a little bit on Twitter, a little bit on instant message slash whatever you want to call it, iMessage, the phone, text messaging, although I'm an idiot. I don't know why I couldn't think of text messaging right away. But nonetheless, man, it's great <laughs> to have you back on the pod to chat Clippers. I'm happy to be back. Um, I've been looking forward to this one for uh, for some weeks. And um 
you know, I haven't been able to like make it happen, but finally long awaited, but we're here. And a lot has changed with the Clippers since the um since the last time that I've been on, so it's it's going to be a fun one. Yeah, there has been a lot that has occurred. The Clippers acquired Rajon Rondo, which uh, sparked a lot on Twitter. The Clippers saw Pat Beverly get hurt once again, and he is going to be out most likely until the playoffs. So a lot has indeed happened. I, I want to go back before we get to what's going on now, because we'll obviously get into the Clippers play, and we'll get into Paul George, we'll get into Kawhi, we'll get into all that. But I want to get back to the Rondo acquisition, and we'll talk a little bit about him and what you've seen now. Um, you and I have been talking this podcast for a while, and I've always felt the Clippers needed to get a backup point guard. And when you and I have had conversations, it's always been, yeah, but you want to get a point guard, but who are you going to get? You don't want to get a guy like George Hill. You don't want to get a guy like Rondo. These guys aren't very good. You want a guy like Kyle Lowry, which is honestly unrealistic for what the Clippers were able to do at the deadline. They end up going and trading away Lou Williams and picks and money to get Rondo. It seemed like a lot when you could have easily gone and signed him during the off season and kept the pick and kept the cash and kept Lou Williams. But that being said, I think what we're seeing, and you and I obviously have gone back and forth on this and I was against Rondo. And I'll be honest, part of it was because I think that what you what guy like Justin Russo, what you guys go and say on Twitter when you bring in these numbers, and you watch the game closer than I do. So if you tell me, you know what, they're better off with PG bringing the ball up, they're better off with Kawhi bringing the ball up, I'm listening to you guys, but I've always thought a point guard was necessary. But now that we've seen Rondo on the floor, I really like him on this team. I think it helps a lot. There are plays that I've seen where you look at Rondo and – He's starting a play, and that's allowing Kawhi and PG to get balls in the paint, in the corners, where PG's been unbelievable. What are your thoughts? Because I know there's a lot to say about Rondo, so I'll let you have the floor. I the, To talk about Rajon Rondo means to kind of backtrack towards the last three years, right? So the reason why I wasn't a fan of Rondo was because if you take – the last three years, right? The last two seasons that he played with the Lakers, the last half season that he's played with the Hawks. Um, he was really, really bad. There's no way around it. He was bad. He was so bad that Laker minds that I trust were calling for his minutes to be cut drastically before the playoffs last year. They did not want him on the floor because he was that bad. He was somebody who hogged up possessions. He was a ball stopper. He wasn't able to shoot. He wasn't able to score. He wasn't a high volume three point shooter. Um, and, and so other than the bubble, he had been really, really bad. And the bubble does count though. So in the bubble, he shot like 40% from three. Um, he was undoubtedly one of the Lakers best players and he contributed to winning a title for them. So for me, I like to look at things a bit more, um, take a full total scope of it. And so I'm not looking at just the bubble. I'm looking at the entire season. And so, I'm looking at someone who's 35, 36, who doesn't have a recent track record of really good basketball. Um, so I didn't like the process of the trade, right? I don't like trading for 35, 36-year-olds who have very limited examples of good play um, in recent memory. That being said, um, there I also tweeted that there is an avenue um, to where – the trade could work for the Clippers, right? He could be helpful. Um, and there are some things that he brings that are just not tangible, right? There's no, there's no statistic for the level of moxie and confidence that he brings to a team with his championship experience and things like that. But for me, I ultimately landed on the trade being a little inconsequential. And the main mainly it's because if you look at the bubble, Rondo was great for the Lakers, but 
if he wasn't great for the Lakers, it wouldn't have mattered much because LeBron and Anthony Davis or LeBron and Anthony Davis, and they ran through the Western Conference. And so for me, um, I look at it as a trade right now, as we sit present day to day, I look at it as like, well, Rondo can be helpful, but the Clippers are so deep at guard that like, if he doesn't play well, the Clippers can simply just not play him. And they have more than enough options to, um, to, to, to supplant him. And so ultimately, you know, he's the hot topic. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about him, but to be quite frank and honest with you, I don't think he for better or worse is going to determine the championship. Like I, I don't think the Clippers won or lost the championship at all with the Rondo trade, but you know, he can be helpful and he has had a great start to his Clipper tenure. There's no doubt about it, especially on defense. Yeah, and I agree with a lot of what you just said, and I understand when you say, you know what, he's not going to be the reason why they win or lose. The one thing that I always go back to, Justin, is that last year, it just seemed like the Clippers fell apart. And I know you will die on this hill that the Clippers lost that 3-1 lead because they (laughs) missed shots that they normally make. I know you will die on that hill, but I will die on the hill that the Clippers didn't have somebody with that moxie and with that ability to help out the two PG and Kawhi stars in order to slow things down and just stop these runs and get veteran leadership in there. It didn't feel like the Clippers had that guy last year. Lou Williams, I don't think, is that guy. Rondo, who's been there, I think is that guy. So I do think that with Rondo last year, for example... I think he would have been a very helpful addition. So whereas he's not going to win you a game most likely or Mm -hmm. lose you a game, I do think that his leadership, his locker room presence, his defense, and just his ability to work with the guards as well, I think will pay dividends for the Clippers team. Now, now that we've seen that Lou Williams is gone, and we see that Rondo is here, and we see that Beverly is hurt, I think I would do this trade 10 times out of 10. Here's my only concern, and I'm curious to get your thought on it. The one scenario I can see happening is that one of Kawhi and PG can't get a shot to go down in the postseason, and the Clippers obviously are going to stagger the two. So they will have one of the two guys on the floor at all times. Let's say Marcus Morris isn't performing. My concern is when you lose a guy like Lou Williams who can get you a bucket, I'm not sure Rondo can do that. And so the question is, who's going to be that guy to get you two points when you need it when Marcus Morris doesn't have his shot going and it's Kawhi or PG with somebody else on the floor? That's my biggest concern right now. And that's ultimately an incredibly valid concern when it comes to Rajon Rondo, because for as great as he is, as far as like his passing, um, he's he's still really good. He's still really good as a defender as well. His IQ is off the charts. When the game slows down and you are in the half court and you're in those situations, as you just mentioned, where they are staggering Kawhi and PG, they are going to help off of Rajon Rondo. They 100% are going to help off of Rajon Rondo. And this is ultimately, and I've tweeted this quite a few times, where, where, what I land, where I land on is like, he's going to have to make shots. Right. The playmaking is great. The passing is great. But as you saw against Phoenix, he was like three or four on threes and they were giving them to him. And so that's going to happen in the playoffs. And they are going to totally disregard Rondo, if for nothing else, because the Clippers are the best shooting team of all time right now. They shoot almost 42 percent on threes as a team. They have like seven guys shooting 40 percent or better from three. So when Rondo is on the floor, he's likely going to be surrounded by a bunch of of players who can shoot so obviously if you need if you need to help off of someone you're going to help off of Rajon Rondo and so that's where um the Clippers can get creative as far as like and they've already done this by um putting Rajon Rondo in like small small screen and rolls to make sure that his man is involved in the play so his man can't cheat 
But if you want to, like, isolate Kawhi Leonard on a block or something like that, they're going to help off of Rajon Rondo's man. And I think at some point in the playoffs, and I think at multiple points in the playoffs, you're going to have to have Rajon Rondo taking a nice chunk of open threes, and he's going to have to make them at a solid rate. And if he does, then everything else that he does becomes infinitely more valuable. If he doesn't, then he becomes a potential liability for as great as of the other traits that he has, um, that's going to determine a lot. Because if you look at what he did in the bubble with the Lakers, a lot of his great performances came because he shot the ball well, because the game slows down in the playoffs, the game gets muddier in the playoffs. And if you have somebody that's constantly being left wide open, you got to make them pay. But thankfully, the Clippers have Reggie Jackson, who's been on fire for literally the entire season you've got luke Kennard right there you've got terrence mann who's come out of his shell patrick beverly when he come, when he gets healthy he's also someone who can um stroke the three balls so i'm actually not that worried about rajon rondo i i i don't feel like like i said i feel like he's inconsequential towards the clippers championship titles title hopes because they simply just won't play him if he's not contributing and I'm not I'm not too concerned with it, um, but I do believe that he at some point will have to be a threat and he'll have to take a solid volume of threes to keep the defense honest, just so that his playmaking can show um, his IQ can show. But um, overall, he's been great to start. He's been great to start. He's been a willing shooter, which has been um, something that I, I've, I've been wanting to see out of him. And and the moxie and the defensive intensity and the frenetic way that he plays defense to the, in these first like couple of games with the Clippers has definitely been encouraging moving forward. And what I was trying to tell you when the trade happened and we were talking about the shooting numbers and going back and forth and his percentages from three is that if he's not making the shots, he'll just come off the floor. I mean, if he's not contributing elsewhere and he's not making his shots and they are indeed leaving him open – then he won't play. That That's the one thing the Clippers have right now is that well, Ty Lu, even with Beverly Hurt, still has a guard problem in one that he doesn't know who he's going to play at guard in a given night. I mean, we saw Terrence Mann go from playing big minutes to playing very few minutes. And then yesterday he was able to get more minutes with guys sitting out. But he still has an issue, Ty Lu does, trying to figure out who's going to play. So if Rondo is indeed making his shots, he's going to play. If he's not making his shots, then he's not going to play. And I give credit to Adam Oslin because we were all going back and forth on Twitter and we were talking about his Rondo's career three-point percentage. And when Adam and I were talking, he was saying, you know what, you look at his beginning of his career versus most recently in the last few years, he's taken way more threes in the last few years and his percentage is higher overall than what it was in his first several seasons in the NBA. So you got to look at the most recent sample size. And I said to you, well, if you look at the postseason, he shot 40% or better in the last two postseasons that he's been in. So I do have high hopes for Rondo because I think the guy is just simply a big game player. It's for me, it's not necessarily the percentage, it's the volume. So the difference between someone shooting 35% from three and somebody shooting 40% from three isn't all that great. It's like a point or two if the difference in volume of three isn't that great. So like, for example, um, his last year with the Lakers, um, he shot like two threes a game, right? He's never taken more than like three threes a game for his entire career. And I think he's only done that like one time. Um, and, and, and to be fair, that's not necessarily the role that he's been asked to play. Um, for for anyone but like you know in the playoffs with the lakers last year his co that was a career high in attempts per game at three for me that is something that i'm watching because if you only are taking three threes a game then i don't really care that you make 40 percent of them because that means that there are far more times 
that you are messing up possessions because when the ball is swung to you, you're not taking you're not taking that shot. You're actually dribbling the ball into defense or you're making an unnecessary pass, which is disrupting flow and p- putting us up against the shot clock more often than we need to be. So for me with Rondo, when I say an acceptable rate, put it like this, I'd rather him shoot 35% from three on like five attempts a game than like 40% from three at like two. It's most, it's more important that he gets the ball up and even not just threes. I'm also talking aggression, aggression as well. Like, there were there was a play against Phoenix where he had the ball on the wing and he just he saw a lane and he took it and he took it and he got to the rim and he got a layup. I love stuff like that from him and I want to see that moving forward and that and that's why the Phoenix game was so encouraging because he was not only just passing but he was also taking threes and he was also looking for his shot. I'm a fan of guards who aren't just out there playing like um police cop where they're just directing people but they're not being like assertive you know Draymond Green is somebody who does that right now for Golden State where if he has the ball on offense he'll tell everybody where to go his IQ is like insane insanely great but he won't take open shots he won't try to score and it messes up the offense it has Golden State playing four on five and so I don't want that to happen when Rajan is on the floor so that Phoenix game was encouraging and really his entire stint with the Clippers has been encouraging thus far because he's not only his passing has not only been on display but he's also sought out his um his own individual offense when appropriate and i think that's what's going to help the clippers just as much as his playmaking and all of the other things that he provides yeah i think his leadership will be huge in the playoffs i think it's gonna be really important so it, it kind of leads us to the the question that normally i would ask you is who's gonna play and which guard should play but i don't think that's an appropriate question to ask because i really do believe this is going to be a game-to-game, situation-to-situation thing with Ty Lu. It's not going to be a, hey, Rondo's getting 20 minutes. Rondo's getting 12 minutes. Hey, Reggie Jackson's I getting X amount of Rondo's minutes. I Rondo's getting 20 minutes. It, here's the thing, though, and, and when I say that, is, by the way, with Pat Beverly Hurt, I think that more likely than not, that, that's going to be the case. But when you get to the playoffs and you have Beverly and you have Reggie Jackson and you have Rondo – and you have Terrence Mann, and you have Luke Kennard, it's easy to say Kennard's going to get a DMP. But it's very possible that based on matchups and based on the way things are going, if they are indeed sagging off a guy like Rondo, you bring in Kennard, and all, all of a sudden the defense can't do that because you leave Kennard open, and he's deadly from three. So I think this is going to be a game-to-game type thing because with Ty Lue now, the job that you and I have talked about when you have a team that's as deep as the Clippers, the hardest part mm-hmm. of it is figuring out who's going to play. And I, we know that Kawhi is going to play. We know Marcus Morris is going to play. We know PG is going to play. The question is when Ibaka gets back, who starts? Everybody in Clipperland thinks it should be Zoo. How many minutes, though, does Zoo get versus Ibaka? Who gets the guard minutes? Does Terrence Mann become the first person off the bench? It, there's a lot for Ty Lu still to figure out. Do you agree? I I absolutely agree, and you know that's why that's why he gets paid the big bucks because those aren't easy decisions. Um, but I do I do think that come playoff time, Rondo is getting the lion's share of those um, backup minutes, and I, I just you could just see it like they are very confident in him, and they brought him in for for that for for the playoffs. So I I think that the rotation that you saw. When the first couple of games, uh, for instance, maybe the Phoenix game, with the exception of like maybe Serge getting minutes to back up um, Zoo instead of like Patrick Patterson, I think the rotations will look something like that. And maybe on occasion, Ty Lue may see something and he'll throw um, Luke Kennard out there for a six minute shift in like game two or something like that. But it won't be, those guys will be depth pieces. They won't be like a part of the core rotation. I look at, I look at the Clippers as having the starters with like surge, um, Nicholas Batum, Rondo. And I look at it, I look at it as like having those eight 
a guys that are going to um to like get the lion's share of the minutes there. But like as you said, it's not an easy it's not an easy fix. Um, it's a great problem to have. And that's kind of been the blessing in disguise for the team this year is that they've had so many injuries and they've dealt with so much on that front that they've allowed guys like Reggie Jackson and Terrence Mann to get a lot of in-season reps so that when the playoffs come, nobody's afraid to throw Terrence Mann in there. You know what I mean? No one's afraid to throw Reggie Jackson in there because we know Reggie Jackson, if the ball is swung to him, he'll be able to knock down an open three. They can't cheat off of Reggie Jackson if Kawhi Leonard is getting the ball in the post or something like that. So, I mean, I don't know how the rotations are going to play out. And I honestly don't think Ty Lue knows. But that's 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 fine right now. You know, they still have like 19 games to uh, to figure all of that out. And, you know, they're not even healthy right now. So I think. Unfor- it's unfortunate that we that we aren't healthy, but the reality is we're not, and that's kind of something that will get figured out as the season goes on. Because if they if you're not healthy, you can't even see what the rotations are going to look like, right? Serge and Patrick Beverly are two of our top what seven guys, mm-hmm. and they aren't they aren't even playing right now, so it's very hard to kind of see what the rotations are going to look like when you are in the middle of the season and you're trying to win games and like, you know, guys are hurt. Like yesterday, Paul George, Serge Ibaka, Patrick Beverly all didn't play. And those guys are obviously going to play in the playoffs. So it's very hard to get a handle on um, what the rotations will look like. But I I honestly am confident in Tyloo, way more confident than I am in Doc Rivers that he won't undercoach the roster. So if we need shooting, I don't think he's going to just die with Rajon Rondo. He will mix it up. Or if we need defense, if we need like a if we need a shift where we need some guard presence to like calm us down, he will throw Rajon Rondo out there. And I I just trust Tyloo. Yeah, a hundred percent. And the thing with the Rondo injury and with Ibaka, but more so not Rondo, pardon me, Pat Beverly. And is now we're at the point with these guys, the Clippers haven't done enough to earn the fact that they deserve to be where they are and that they are a title contender because they haven't even made the Western conference finals. And so they need to earn the ability to make up these excuses where every single year it's injuries. Like, listen, injuries happen. It's part of basketball, and that's part of roster construction when you continue to build around guys that are hurt year after year. like That's just the way things now go with Pat Beverly is that he doesn't stay healthy, and availability is so important now. And if you're not going to be available, then so be it. you got to move on. And to go to your uh, Suns game comparison, just for people to get an idea of what Justin's talking about, because I think Justin's pretty – spot on and where he is, is that Kawhi, 38 minutes, PG, 34. That'll be closer, I'm guessing, to 38. Marcus Morris, 30. Zoo, 24. Beverly, 17. Batum, 27. Patterson, 19. Those will go to Ibaka. Rondo, 19. And Reggie Jackson, 24. And then you look at Terrence Mann, 5. And Luke Kennard, 1. So I know everyone wants uh, Terrence Mann to play, but if everything's going well, I think, unfortunately, Terrence Mann is the guy. That gets bumped. But all it takes is one injury. All it takes is one guy playing poorly it, it, for something to happen. And Terrence Mann, you know, Luke, Luke Kennard are going to be ready, I think, when their name's called upon. Yeah, I mean, it already happened with Patrick Beverly's hand. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, you know, things happen in the playoffs. And, you know, th- there's no guarantee that we're going to stay healthy. There's going to be games where guys are in foul trouble. Um, They're going to be like, Marcus Morris in game six against Dallas last year in the playoffs got ejected. You know, so we don't want that to happen. But right. like, that's what I mean is they they're going to get opportunities to like help us win a game or two when it matters. Um, so I'm not I'm, I'm I think the Suns game was like I think Paul George and Kawhi will be closer to like 40 minutes in the playoffs. But that's roughly how I think the rotations will end up going. But, you know, it's it's I, I like the fact that Terrence Mann is a depth piece. I don't know how I feel about um, him being exercised out of the rotation entirely, mm-hmm. given the fact that he provides something to the team 
that no one else does. But, you know, if it's working out, it's working out. And so I'm taking a wait and see approach and we'll just see what happens. And, you know, unfortunately, Patrick Beverly's hand got broken and, you know, he's, he's probably done for the season. And so this is honestly Terrence Mann's chance to, like, really hammer home the the idea that he has to play in the playoffs. You know, I don't know what more he can do, but, like, this is his chance, right? This is an opportunity that he and Luke Kennard are going to have. And you'll find out a lot from now until the end of the season with their level of play. And, and if they rise to the occasion or if they surpass that, then Ty Lue will have some really tough conversations. But, like, there's still 19 games to play, and there's still a lot a lot of decisions to be made, and that's why they play the games. Let's talk about where the team is right now, and I know there's a lot you want to get to. So if, oh, I'm, if, oh, I, yeah. if I'm missing something, then feel free, hop in. It's your show as much as it is mine. So if there's something you want to talk about, feel free and let me know. But right now, the Clippers are 10-2 and two in their last 12. And if you had told me before the stretch – and I said it in the intro that if you had told me coming into the homestand, that's nine games, the Clippers would go seven and two. I'd be thrilled. I said seven and two is where you want to be. If you want to be labeled a contender, seven and two is where you want to be. Now, you, we can go back and forth about the Orlando loss and the one the Clippers obviously led the entire game. And it should be eight and one if they just didn't fall apart. And then you lose to Denver. But for the Clippers to rebound the way they have and beat Portland and beat Phoenix and before that beat Philadelphia and beat Milwaukee. The Clippers being 10-2 and two in their last 12 is really impressive. And I, I want to bring up something from Justin, um, Justin Russo. is He said, with just 18 games left in the season, the Clippers are shooting 41.8% from three and 841 from the free throw line. It's on pace to be the second best three-point percentage of all time and the best ever free throw percentage. And they're still on pace to be the only team to go 40% from three-point line and 80% from the free-throw line in the same season. We've talked at nauseum this year about can the hot three-point shooting continue. We now have a large enough sample size where this team is just really good at generating open threes, and they have a lot of shooters on this team. There's going to be a game, and I'll put even an S at the end of that, There's going to be games in the playoffs where the Clippers lose because they're missing threes. That's just going to happen. That's just the way. If you're a shooting team and you take a lot of shots, but there are going to be games where the Clippers win by 15 to 20 because they're killing uh, these teams from three. So when you look at the team right now and the way they're built and with all these threes, does that concern you at all? going into the postseason, having to rely so much on the three ball? Uh, In a word, no. I mean, not even a little bit. Um, And the reason why is because if you, the Clippers are now in the top 10 in defense and they've won 11 of 14 and over those last 14 games, they're sixth in defense. And so if you like, take a look at even the Denver game that they lost, like they kept, Uh, one of the best offenses ever in check. And so when you ask what's the state of the team for me, it's that end of the floor. They've really come alive on the defensive end of the floor and they've made me very comfortable and confident in their ability to maybe win a title this year. And it has a lot to do with the fact that they are defending. Now the three point shot is going to come and go. And I don't think that's exclusive to the Clippers. They shoot it really well, but like, if Utah or if Phoenix, like if they don't make threes, they're going to lose the game. Like you're when you don't make shots in the NBA, you lose. There's no way around it. I don't think the Clippers are overly reliant on threes. Like um, if I can if I can pull this up really quickly, they are um, I have the computer in front of me. They are just league average in three point attempts. Like they're fifteenth in the league in three point attempts. So it's not like they're just like bombs away from the three-point line in fact i wish they would i wish a team this good shooting the ball they actually should be shooting more threes in my opinion but nonetheless um i don't actually think they are that reliant on the three-point line at all 
Um, I think that in general, they are a jump shooting team, but they get a ton of wide open shots. And that's the product of good offense. And if they continue to get good shots and open shots in the playoffs, then it's just make or miss. Like there's nothing we can do if they get open shots in the playoffs and they miss. We'll lose. But if I'm going to lose and I lose on the fact that I'm just missing open shots, then so be it. But the whole point of offense for me is to get open shots. And the Clippers do that and they get open threes. And more than anything, they're defending now, right? Like for for the year, I think um I mentioned it that they are now they are now like over the last 14 games, they're sixth in defense. And that looks like that's going up with a rocket. Rondo, if you the way they are defending the Suns, the way that they defended the Bucks, the way that they defended the Blazers, like these are not easy offenses to defend, and they have completely stifled them. And you know, nationally, it's not getting talked about, but it's something that I've been paying attention to all year, just because the Clippers' offense is so damn good. They shoot the ball so damn well that like I don't care. I don't even look at the offense that. I mean, I do, but I don't look at it that that intently because it's the other end of the floor for this roster, and they are finally starting to live up to their defensive potential. So even if they go cold, even if they just can't make a shot in like game four of the second round, I still have faith that they can win that game because of what's happening right now. And it's the fact that they are on a streak defensively. They have found their identity. They're long. They're agile. They're playing with consistent effort on that end of the floor. Like, I know the Rockets are undermanned, and I know that they are a lottery team. They aren't the team that we're used to, but they held an NBA team to 10 points in the second quarter. And really, it was eight before the um, the, the bogus foul that we did last night. But, like, in the second quarter, they held an NBA team to 10 points. And so I don't think that's being talked uh, talked about enough with this team, is that they are coming alive on the defensive end of the floor, and it's made me so much more... Or like not even worried about their reliance on threes, which isn't even in the case. They don't even take anywhere near the league leading at, at, in terms of like three point attempts. So it's the defense. For the ones who know safety isn't a catchphrase, it's a culture. And the ones who help make sure everyone makes it home safe. For the safety minded who watch everyone's backs, Granger offers supplies and solutions for every industry as well as safety assessments and training to keep your facilities safe and your people safer. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Johnsonville sausage strips are strips of sausage that look and cook like bacon. They come in amazing flavors like original, maple, or chorizo. Now you can transform your BLT into an SLT or turn your bacon cheeseburger into a chorizo cheeseburger. It's not bacon. It's Johnsonville sausage strips. And it's a meaty miracle. Find it by the bacon, even though it's sausage. Let's take a quick break from our conversation with Justin to tell you about what we've got going on here at HoopBall. Hoop-ball.com. How about the fantasy pass? Are you playing fantasy basketball? Are you getting close to the playoffs? Do you want to win a title? I know you want to win, just like all of us. Fancy draft season is nearly over, and you want to raise that trophy. The guys at HoopBall want to help you do that. Fancy Pass is still the best deal in the industry, just $4.99 per month. That means zero commitment. No commitment. Try for one month. If you don't like it, you can cancel. But I know you're going to love it. Not only will you love the Discord server, which has hoop ball pros in there around the clock to help you with their teams, whether it's a rate my team, it's a trade advice, it's an ad drop, there's a streaming schedule. It's all there in the Discord channel. There is the tweet storm every single night breaking down every game, every relevant fantasy player. Of course, you also have the new fantasy appraiser tools, schedule and streaming charts, pickups, drops. It's all there with the fantasy plus. Pass. Please do check it out. Head to hoop ball.com and click on the fancy pass ad just below the main media wall. All right, back to Justin. 
That surprises me, by the way, the fact that they are where they are in terms of three-point attempts. And that says a lot because you can look at the percentage and say, is it going to keep up and all that kind of stuff. But the fact that they're not taking as many as they are, that kind of answers my question as to, are they going to be in trouble relying on the three ball? Because your answer is they don't take as many as maybe they even should. So if the three ball is not going down, yeah, it's going to hurt them and they probably will lose, but they have other avenues to win. And that one of those is the defense and you can look at the defense and during this stretch where the Clippers have been really good defensively, a lot of it was without Patrick Beverly and how many years have we now gone where it was reliant upon Beverly being on the floor for this team to be good and to win games. All of a sudden, the Clippers are figuring out a way to win and to compete and to play defense without Pat Beverly. And so that's really important for the Clippers. And you look at this stretch and the Clippers now are flexing their muscles and they have a pretty easy schedule to round things out. So we've talked about where the Clippers might end up and the two seed is absolutely in reach and yep, yep. they have played really well and to win 10 of your last 12 and to do a lot of it without Pat- Patrick Beverly, it says a lot about where this team is right now. Nah, absolutely. And, and I think guys like Reggie Jackson, they Reggie Jackson has taken a jump on that end of the floor. He's not Patrick Beverly, but he's a better defender this year than he was last year. And I think guys like Zoo getting like a nice chunk of minutes, he's playing like, I want to say he's over 30 minutes a night over the last like 12 games or so. And that has helped. Like, when Zoo is on the floor, we are a tremendous defensive team. Um, when he is on the floor and he's our defensive anchor, um, our, our, it's no coincidence that our defense, our defensive metrics, and I think, in my opinion, the eye test kind of supports it, too. It's no coincidence that as Zoo has played more, our defense has, like, skyrocketed. And I... I'm that if there, if nothing else, this is the real reason why he unequivocally should not only be starting come playoff time, but he should be playing at least 30 minutes a night, probably maybe a little bit more like the Clippers defense with zoo on the floor. Um, it would put them near the top of the NBA. Um, if you, if it just by like defensive rating and you know, he's a gigantic big man who protects the rim he's he has a crazy motor i'm a huge fan of his i don't want to go on like a crazy zoo rant Hmm. but you know him playing more and our defense taking off is not a coincidence because as much as i love patrick beverly your rim protection and your five man means way more than your guards when it comes to defense and that is the that is if nothing else the main reason why Zeus should be on the floor for as many minutes as he can handle because as long as he's on the floor our defense will be at worst competent and at best it'll be the best in the NBA and if that's the case come playoff time your the clippers will win i i, I have a hard time Thinking, I have a hard time seeing them not having a shot come playoff time if Zoo is playing that many minutes because, as we've already talked about, the Clippers' offense is historic. Their problem is not offense. It is not offense. I, it, I'm going to say it again. It is not offense. It is the defensive side of the ball. And when Zoo plays, we are great defensively. When he doesn't, it gets kind of tricky. So, um, yeah, I... I, I I I love the fact that we're able to defend without Patrick Beverly, but it's because of Zoo. Yeah, and it's funny, Justin, that now we're at the point where we're less than 20 games before the playoffs, and it feels like we're finally getting to the lineup that we kind of expected before the season mm-hmm. started. We expected okay. Zoo to be the starting center. We expected right. Marcus Morris to be in there. We obviously got that Nick Batum time to start the season, and we got the Baca time at center, but it feels like the Clippers are finally rounding into the lineup that all of us who have been following this team for a couple of years expected. And that's a good thing because it means the Clippers are following the numbers and they're following the eye test. And the eye test proves that Zoo is a tremendous center, both offensively and defensively. Offensively, yep. a good offensive rebounder, a gr- good guy setting screens, and just someone that is great person to have on the floor. I want to ask you something. I'm not sure if you know the answer. Um, the Clippers last year in offensive rating and where they were and defensive rating where they were, 
I believe they were mm-hmm. close to being top 10 in both, weren't they? Uh, they were beyond top 10 in both. They were yeah. second in offense and fifth in defense last year. And, and that's where I'm kind of hesitant to look at these, hey, best offense in history. I mean, best offense in history, that was Dallas last year. And the Clippers beat I mean, Dallas in the first really round. they were really good on offense last yeah. year. Yeah, no, for sure. And, and the Clippers, you look at Dallas. Dallas is the best offense in the NBA, best offense in history, surpassing even the Warriors, and the Clippers beat them in round one. And so for the Clippers to be, like you said, second and fifth last year, it still didn't get them to the Western Conference Finals. So there has to be something besides for the actual numbers and the offensive rating and the defensive rating. There has to be those intangibles. And I think those intangibles are going to be two things. And I'll let you you come in because I think uh, you obviously – I I know you have something to say for sure. I think the tangible is going to be PG coming to perform. I think he needs mm-hmm. to be that one B. And I think it's going to be having that leadership and someone like a guy like Rondo, I think will be important, but go ahead. What are your thoughts? No, I was going to say that like, you know, the play, those numbers are the product of like 82 games or like in the, in the case of the last couple of years, 72 games. Right. So if you, you can't necessarily apply that directly to the playoffs just because the playoff side, the playoffs are a small sample, right? The Dallas Mavericks had the best offense in history up until last year with that offensive rating, but they only played six playoff games. So I, I it's and and the Clippers only played 13 playoff games total last year. So they very well could have be like they very well could have been like elite on offense, elite on defense. But, you know, it's it's those numbers are just more of a talking point, right? To ask yourself what's actually happening. Um they it's not necessarily meant to to automatically say like oh, this team is just a great defense because the defensive rating is what it is. It's more or less to ask, like, what is happening? Why is this the case? And um, for me, like, when I watch the Clippers this year as opposed to last year, um, I think in last year and this year, both teams have had potential to be really great on defense. But one of the things that I've said that, I don't think a lot of people are giving credence to is the Clippers absolutely flamed out last year. That's no doubt about it. They definitely wet the bed, um, choked, whatever, whatever adjective you want to use. But we now see that Nikola Jokic is going to win the NBA's MVP award. It's not like they lost to a underwhelming team. Um, The Denver Nuggets are really good. Like, and they are even better this year. Um, And, and so you know, being a great defense does not mean you're going to be able to handle Nikola Jokic over the course of seven games. And so I don't I don't look at those metrics as being flawed. I only look at how we interpret them as flawed. Um, all all I see when I see those is that the Clippers have a really great defense that alone is not going to propel them to like the NBA finals or to a championship. But it is it is indicative of how good they can be on that end of the floor. But to your point, there are other things and other factors that are going to have to come into play that are going to have that are going to determine whether or not they win or lose and whether or not Paul George steps up, whether or not our role players make shots, whether or not Ty Lue's decision making is up to par, all of those things are going to go a long way towards um, whether or not we win or lose. But yeah, like like I said, um, defensive rating and offensive rating are more or less a way they're they're measuring stick. They're not necessarily they're measuring stick against like seventy two games. They're not necessarily. If you like, we didn't play Denver for the entire regular season. So how we look defensively over the course of 72 is not going to necessarily be the same as we do against like Denver in a playoff series, for example, or something like that. I want to talk about PG because last Thursday there was a lot of talk about Paul George's foot and concerns around it. He was five of 15 against Denver. He was two of seven from three. And there were major worries about him. You now go forward more than one week. And against Portland, 11 of 18 from the field, 6 of 9 from 3, 8 of 8 from the line. Against Phoenix, 12 of 19 from the field, 7 of 9 from 3, 2 of 2 from the line. 
He ends up with 33 points in that game, 36 the game prior. He now has 69 points in his last two games. I am stunned at how this is all of a sudden gone from this guy may be a liability because he's hurt. Is he going to be okay to where he is now? I mean, it, it's it's caught me off guard. Is it caught you off guard? Uh, a little, a little bit. You know, I'm I'm not a doctor, so I don't know what a bone edema um actually is, or mm-hmm. like how it affects somebody on a day to day. Maybe that's sort of like a pain that comes and goes. Um, maybe he's just now starting to get used to it. Um, I saw that um, after the Phoenix game, he and Ty Lue mentioned that they are going to shoot more threes to compensate for the um, the toe injury, which is what he should have been doing anyway. Um, so maybe that's it. You know what I mean? Just him being aggressive and him realizing that he is an elite shooter and he probably should get the ball in the air more. Um, but like, as far as whether or not it's surprising to me, um, a little, but like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how that affects, um, anyone on a day to day. You know what I mean? Like, had, had you heard of that injury before? Uh, I heard it before once or twice because it knocked somebody out. Um, I, I now forget who it was because there was a, there was a player that had it last year, I believe. Um, or two years ago, and it sidelined them. Because I remember when PG got hurt, we, we were immediately flash. We were mere going backwards to the player that had it. But nonetheless, um, okay, so where do you want to go next? What's the biggest topic of conversation here? Because we've hit a bunch of stuff. Uh, I think for me... DeMarcus uh, Cousins! No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, I'm kidding. <laughs> re- I think for me, Reggie Jackson would be the last one that I think we touch on. What are your thoughts? Uh, he's fastly becoming my favorite player. Um, Can the Clippers count on him in the playoffs? I I think so. Okay. I think so. And the reason why is because it'll be on Ty Lue to put him in advantageous positions. But he shot 53% from three in the playoffs last year. And if you recall, he made some huge threes in that Dallas series for us. I mean, his decision making wasn't where it needed to be. But I I thought he kind of got a bad rap a little bit for what he did in the playoffs and he's only gotten better since then. And, you know, I, I don't look at what he's done this year as being particularly too much of an outlier because he's not playing outside of himself. You don't see him taking too many ill-advised shots or you don't see him making too many ill-advised, like, dives to the rim or anything like that. Um, he's literally, he's taking he's taking his wide-open threes. When he sees a lane, he's taking it. Um, he's getting the ball to like Kawhi and PG. He's playing off of them. And so those things I think are replicable in the playoffs. And more than anything, his defense has gotten better and it's gotten competent and it's gotten to a point that is like, okay, we won't die if Reggie Jackson's on the floor guarding someone. Now he'll still be targeted because he will probably be the worst of the five defenders on the floor when he's on the floor, but that doesn't mean he's bad. And I think his shooting is noteworthy enough to where not only is he dependable, but we're going to have to take a long, hard look at making sure that Reggie Jackson is one of the members of the rotation come playoff time because that shooting that shooting and that juice that he has with the ball is just invaluable, man. What do you think? I think that it's incredible what he's done. And it's funny when you look back to the start of the season, there were the lineups with Lou and Reggie and Kennard, and everyone's like, okay, that can't happen. Ty Lue's like, that, that, that ain't going to happen. You now have gotten rid of Lou Williams and brought in Rondo, who is a much better defender. Kennard is basically a DNP. So now you're left with Reggie Jackson. Uh, I'm not sure anyone would have expected from the three of those players yeah, exactly. that Reggie Jackson would be the one that would emerge from the three, considering that one of those guys getting paid four years, $64 million starting next year. Another one is a sixth man player of the year, GOAT. And the other one is Reggie Jackson. I mean, he is now shooting a career high in field goal percentage and a career high in three point percentage. And that's a testament to the Clippers offense and what Ty Lue has done to get the best out of Reggie Jackson and for him to sit on the bench and then automatically be ready when called upon to start and contribute. I mean, this guy yesterday was playing like he is the damn leader of this team. 
I, I mean, who expected Reggie Jackson in a game against the Rockets to go ahead and start and go 10 of 14 from the field, 6 of 9 from 3, 26 points, 4 rebounds, 7 assists, 2 steals. I mean, that is damn near top 15 NBA type numbers when you look at <laughs> that kind of stuff, you know? And yeah. it, it's it gives me optimism and a big credit to Ty Lu and for him to get Reggie Jackson to this place and frankly to build the confidence in a guy like Reggie Jackson because it could have been shot after last year's playoffs. But for him to be the player that he is this year is a testament to the coaching staff and most importantly is a testament to Reggie Jackson and his ability to want to get better and contribute each and every day on this team. Nah, you're, you 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 hit the nail on the head. He's been a total professional this year too. Um, whatever role Ty has given him, he's taken it in stride. He hasn't been like a malcontent at all. Um, his spirit has always been in the right place. And like, you know, it's kind of scary to think what where we would be this year without Reggie Jackson. You know, he's a late, late offseason veterans minimum um signing, and like he's in the 96th percentile of catch and shoot jump shots in the half court. Um, he's totally outplayed his contract. And um, I am very grateful that he's on our team. Given given how this has played out with Patrick Beverly again, um, it's it's a blessing that Reggie Jackson was able to more than rise to the occasion. And he's one of the reasons, one of the real reasons why I'm optimistic that he not only is going to play in the playoffs, but have a big have a big role like I don't mean like a star role but like for instance the Clippers are damn near unstoppable when this year at least statistically when Reggie Jackson Paul George and Kawhi Leonard are on the floor this year I think they're like a plus 18 per 100 possessions and that is like that is like elite big three like territory and so that just gives you some perspective to how good he's been this year and i'm really looking forward to how he helps us in the playoffs but before the playoffs come we still got 19 18 games to go yep and to add to that by the way justin russo the clippers have a 19.9 net rating in the 277 minutes that reggie jackson paul george and Kawhi leonard have shared the floor this season and he said not to mention a 127.6 offensive rating it's the best offensive rating among the 579 trios to log 250 plus minutes in the NBA this season. There you go. And that's I, I, if you're not paying attention, it may not. It may sound like, OK, anybody who plays with Kawhi Leonard and Paul George will have a um, ha, will have an impact like that. But Reggie Jackson is not just somebody that's on the floor with the, when he's on the floor with those two. He's making life easier for both of them on both ends of the floor. And like I, I, I he's had the, like you cited the game yesterday against the Houston Rockets. And it feels like he's had that game so many times this year where a guy gets injured. Like I remember in Boston, like he started, he started, um, he started for Kawhi Leonard um, when we were playing in Boston um, this year and he had like 30. And so like, he's just been fluid, whatever we've needed from him, he's provided. And then some, and like, I'm really, I'm, I'm really optimistic that he can help us in the playoffs. I, because that skill that he has, that elite skill of catch and shoot is like so valuable come playoff time. Like Paul George and Kawhi Leonard are going to be seeing multiple defenders and having someone who is as good as Reggie Jackson at catching and shooting. It's a, it's, it's a godsend. Yeah. 18 games left. Um, I would say the Clippers go 13 and five or 14 and four in the final 18. There's some really easy games in there. Um, so that would put the Clippers if they went 13 and five, that would put them at 49 and 23, which is very, very good. Um, it's not going to be enough to win the West, in my opinion, I don't think. Um, Definitely not. Because you're still four games back of the Jazz, and 49 and 23 would mean the Jazz go 10 and 10 over their final 20. Um, but you look at 49 and 23, that would mean that the Suns would have to go 13 and 8 over their final uh, set of games. So. It's possible, but I think the Clippers will see most likely as that three seed, if not the two seed, because they have the games there. Did we touch on everything, Justin? Is there anything else that you want to get off your chest? Uh, nah, this was, <laughs> this was cathartic. Um, I got, we, we, we touched on a lot. I, how do you feel about DeMarcus Cousins? 
I'm okay with what he's going to be. I mean, it, clearly, you look at yesterday's game, and if there was going to be a game where Boogie played big minutes, it was going to be yesterday. And then you look at the box score, and Boogie Cousins played six minutes. So he, he's just going to be a guy that's there. Um, I, I don't think he's going to disrupt the locker room. I think he just wants to win a title. Um, and it was a 10-day contract, by the way, so it's possible they don't even renew it. Um, but at the same time, it wouldn't surprise me if they did just sign him for the rest of the season as someone they can have as a backup big. I mean, I don't really anticipate Patrick Patterson getting more minutes than DeMarcus Cousins, but that's kind of where we are right now. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, I I look at DeMarcus in the Joachim Noah role. Yep. Um, and, and Joachim Noah did not play at all last year when he played for us. Yeah. And I, I think DeMarcus is more or less the same. Um, but yeah, I don't have too strong of an opinion on that. Um, he's also a different name, player, by the way, than, than uh, the one that he was oh, with yeah. at Houston. I mean, we, if you watch DeMarcus Cousins for two minutes on the floor, he gets that ball in the top of the key. He was shooting that three with Houston. He's not shooting it with the Clippers. So he's a different player than he is with the Clippers. He knows his role. Yeah, I don't I don't think there's an issue as far as ro- knowing your role. I just don't think that if, with with a fully healthy Clippers – um, there's just not there's not minutes there, right? Like he's not better than Zoo. He's not better than Serge. He doesn't. He's there's just no minutes for a third center. And really, you're talking about a potentially fourth center because Nicholas Batum is probably our third center. Um, if you want to, if you really want to talk about it. Um, so I, I there's I just wanted to get your opinion on on Demarcus. Um, he's he's great as an emergency big. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. maybe maybe in the playoffs there's some foul trouble and we need like the last three minutes of the second quarter and he provides like a few offensive rebounds a few putbacks um but anything outside of that um you know i i don't i don't expect much from him but i do think he'll be he'll be here for the rest of the year yeah i agree and i think you're spot on there he's not going to play most likely he'll play if the clippers are up by 20 or 25 in a game in the playoffs um and like you said if there's foul trouble but it's it, Zoo and Ibaka are going to get the majority of the center minutes, if not all 48 center minutes. So it's an addition. It's a guy you need it. Someone that's a third center, because if a guy like Ibaka gets hurt in a game and then you see Zoo get in foul trouble, you just need somebody on that roster. And so I, I'm, I'm glad the Clippers recognize that and got Boogie in there. And I mean, he's too slow. He's not a guy that can go back and forth up the floor. He moves too slowly. But he's a guy that can shoot the three. So if you give it to him and it's open, he'll shoot it. He'll get you rebounds, like you said. I mean, he racks up blocks and steals. So he's there. And if he gets the minutes and he's called upon, then so be it. But it's not someone that's going to be the reason why that the team wins the NBA title. I mean, just like I think you look at Brooklyn. Well, Marcus Aldridge is not going to be why the Brooklyn Nets win the NBA title. Exactly. Aldridge exactly. sucks, man. Aldridge is not the guy that he was before. I mean, he's had a couple of decent games. But LaMarcus Aldridge, Blake Griffin, they're not going to be why Brooklyn wins the title if that happens. Those two guys are not the players that they were a couple of years ago. Exactly. Um, they're they're good. They're good. Yeah. But like they're not going to rely on LaMarcus Aldridge and Blake Griffin. Um, no disrespect to, to the Clipper legend, BG, but those guys are like really good buyout guys, but they're buyout guys for a reason, you know, and um you know, we shouldn't get too attached to buyout guys like DeMarcus Cousins or um, Andre Drummond or um, LaMarcus Aldridge. Like, those guys are our buyout guys for a reason. And, um, yeah, they're emergency bigs, and, you know, we'll see what happens. But um, I, I think I think the Clippers are in a really good spot, and I love the fact that I was able, well, we were able to uh, touch on their defense because they're in a really good spot in part because – their defense has finally come alive and they're finally in the top 10 in defense. And that that's great. That's that bodes well for, um, for our future championship hopes and doing it without Patrick Beverly. I mean, it says a lot about this team that without Patrick Beverly, they have the defense that they have. And it's always been there. It's always been yeah. there. You can go back to the, I mean, I had a pod with Shane young and we were talking. It's like the most frustrating thing with this team is that it's always been there. The ability to get stops and play good defense. And it's so infuriating when they're lazy in games yep. l- like we've seen before against the New Orleans, for example, leaving Lonzo Ball wide open. I mean, you have the ability 
to just be better defensively. You have Kawhi Leonard and Paul George, and you have Zoo. With those three guys, there's no reason why you shouldn't be stopping teams. So I'm glad to see it. The Clippers are doing well, and that makes me happy. But it's it's always the playoffs, and the playoffs are always where we get let down. So hopefully this year is different than others. We'll have you on in a couple of weeks, Justin, and we'll see where the Clippers are at that point. Justin Wilson, LA Clippers Film is where you can find him on Twitter. One of the best follows out there for any Twitter. Nowhere. It doesn't matter where you are. Justin Wilson, one of the best uh, follows uh, out there. Justin, always appreciate you, my dude. I have the feelings mutual, my brother. Can't wait to get back on again. Well, it was long overdue to have Justin Wilson on, and it went about an hour. So we got a lot done in that hour. We chatted about a bunch. I really hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. And this is a podcast that you can listen to for a while. It's not like it's going to be expired after a day or two. I mean, obviously more games will happen, but a really important pod that hits on, frankly, everything that needed to be hit on because this is a squad that we're all excited about. There's no doubt about it. We are really excited about this team. And you know what else I'm excited about? I'm excited about the NFL draft. NFL draft season's upon us. It's possible you might have Trevor Lawrence's haircut in your pants. That's why our partners at Manscaped, the leaders in below-the-waist grooming, have partnered with us to make sure you don't gamble on shaving your balls the same way you like to gamble on football. For all my draft geeks, we have an exclusive 20% off promo code hootball20 at manscaped.com will your favorite team go defensive back in the first round not sure but i am sure that with the lawnmower 3.0 you can be proud of what you're showing down there because of their ceramic blade and skin safe technology your nicks and snags will be reduced it's the perfect protection needed for your franchise quarter balls i want you to look in the mirror did you see any nose or ear hairs dangling look fellas 79% 79% of partners polled admitted that long nose hair is a major turnoff. The Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer is your solution. Why not use the best tools for the job here? Get 20% off and free shipping with the code HOOPBALL20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use the code HOOPBALL20. It's time you turn that team in your pants around with Manscaped. All right, so the Clippers... They've got a couple of games coming up. The final game of this homestand against the Detroit Pistons, a game that they really should win, and it should not be all that close. After Detroit, they've got Indiana Tuesday, Detroit again on Wednesday, and then Philadelphia on Friday. More likely than not, we will not have a show until next weekend. Personal note, set to welcome a child into our family early on next week in a couple of days. So most likely we'll not have a show until next weekend. And that's when we can talk, chat about the two Detroit games, Indiana, and then at Philadelphia. And the game against at Philadelphia should be a really good one because Embiid is back. And so Embiid, Simmons, Tobias Harris, everybody's healthy. It should be a game that we didn't get to see earlier in the season because Embiid was hurt. But the Clippers obviously won that game during um, or pardon me, right before, actually, no, to start this homestand. Yeah, wow, it's been a while. March 27th, they won that game 122 to 112. So you back next week. Follow me on Twitter, at BD Marcus. Follow the Twitter handle for the Hoopball Clippers podcast, at Hoopball Clips. Rate and review the podcast. It always does help us. And really, a huge thank you to you for listening. Until next time, I'm Brandon Marcus, and go Clips. This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation.